Good morning, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to our webinar this morning um, on securing our future female founders in rural areas. And I'm going to pass you on to my colleague, Ulton Faherty, who will do the introductions. And just um, to a reminder, just to bear with us this morning, please, God, we won't lose electricity, but we do have other people in the background who take over. So if we do lose a connection, we'll get back on straight away. And if anyone does lose power, we'll forward out the um, recording afterwards. OK, thank you. If I unmute myself, it helps. Uh, thanks very much, Neve, uh, and you're welcome, everybody, to our uh, webinar this morning. Kate Milafalsha, Gach Enya, on Shahar Majin. Um, so uh, this event is born out of uh, some activity that we've been engaged in in Westwick. So Westwick is the business and innovation centre for the West and the Northwest region, and we work in partnership with a lot of organisations. Um, in supporting enterprise uh, in that area. Uh, enterprise Ireland, Uders na Gaeltachta, I know we have some folks here from uh, Uders na Gaeltachta today, uh, local enterprise offices, uh, institutes of technology and enterprises. Um, so the projects that we're involved in currently, Inside T and W Power, uh, they have some elements of uh, female entrepreneurship, uh, rural tourism, uh, sustainability, um, an interesting concept called intergenerational learning, which is basically sharing knowledge uh, to the, for the benefit of others. So uh, being involved in those two projects, we decided uh, that there was merit here in pulling together an event just to focus and to address some of those issues, because we know they're of interest to a lot of uh, enterprises and startups and agencies up and down the country. So we're delighted at this event today uh, and we'll be joined by two speakers. Uh, the first up will be Raquel Naboa of Fifty Shades Greener and we'll be joined later as well by Catherine O'Grady Powers of Glen Keane Farm. Uh, so they're going to basically share their experiences with us, uh, a female entrepreneurship journey, uh, their experiences, looking at sustainability, looking at rural tourism um, and, uh, you know, and sustainable business models. So they're some of the key themes that we'll be looking at. We'll also have two brief presentations on the outcomes of the Insight T project and the W Power project. So um, without further ado, I'm going to invite Raquel uh, to uh, you know, tell us her story. Raquel, I know, is uh, on, the, uh, on the, the edge of the Cliffs of Moher at the moment. Um, and I know uh, she's having some issues with Wi-Fi. Um, so Raquel, um, as, as Neve said, uh, you know, we'll bear with you and you'll bear with us and everybody hopefully will bear with us as well. And if things do go down, um, you know, we may have to be flexible with the agenda. So, Raquel, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we're delighted to have you along. So I'll, I'll let you take over, Raquel, and, and tell us a little bit about you and your story. Perfect. I really hope I don't lose you this morning. I've lost you three times already, so um, I'll do my best. I'm actually going to stop my video so that the connection should be a bit stronger. Um, Oh, sorry, Alton, would you somebody be able to give me access to share my screen? You should have it there, Raquel. Um, host disabled, no. Right now? Yes, yes, that's it. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> we start with an eventful morning. So thank you everyone for taking the time to be here and listen to our stories today. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, my name is Raquel Naboa. I'm the founder of Fifty Shades Greener, a leading educational company teaching environmental sustainability around the world. My own career up until 2017 was in hospitality. To be honest, I kind of fell into hospitality by pure chance. I was 17 years old when my dad offered me a one-way ticket to whatever I wanted to go. And destiny has it that a week later, I landed in Shannon in County Clare. I had no English at the time, and so my only option was to clean bedrooms as a housekeeping assistant for my first year in Ireland, which was quite a shock to my system at the time. My immediate family are all academics. My mom is a doctor, my dad is a psychologist turned politician, and my sister is a marine biologist. 
When my parents asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I literally had no idea. Two things I did know is that I wanted to be challenged by my career every day, but that I also wanted to have fun at my job. Needless to say, they all thought I was crazy or lazy or a mix of both. I've never been a person that learns through conventional methods of education or books. Oh no. I think we may have lost her, but I think she's coming back on there now. I'm back. Sorry, I'm back. Oh, Lord. Yeah. I've never been a person that learned through books or conventional educational methods, which are still very much teacher led. Back when I was young, I felt inferior and not good enough because I learned in a different way than my family members. I've carried those feelings of inferiority pretty much my entire adult life but I was blessed to fall into hospitality the way I did. All of a sudden, I found that place in the world where I could learn by doing. I could learn by watching other people doing their jobs. And it led me to have an amazing career with many different managerial positions in different countries. It was 2012 when I started learning about sustainability. Back then, climate change was not really spoken about as often as it is now. Back then, there was little explanation as to what was going on to the regular person like me. It was something the scientists and governments would argue about. I had already experienced firsthand what nature can do to humanity. I was working in the Maldives in 2004 when the Boxing Day tsunami came and hit our island, destroying so many lives in just a few minutes. Eco-anxiety is real. I suffered it myself for years after that event. The turning point for me was when I was working at Hotel Doolan in County Clare, and I learned how to measure our business carbon emissions. This is when I realized that if I could measure those emissions, I could also manage them and reduce them. And it then became my life's mission to learn more about sustainability within hospitality. And I started creating what I now call the 50 Shades Greener Method for Sustainability. The 50 Shades Greener Method has four phases. First, we measure. If we're looking at environmental sustainability, we measure our impact on the environment. If we're looking at our social sustainability, we measure the happiness and productivity of our team or how we're impacting our wider community. The second step is observation, which simply means to observe and take a stock of your behavior, your team's behavior and all the systems and processes at the business. From the measurement and observation phases, we come to the implementation of an action plan. What are we going to do? When are we going to do it? And how are we going to do it? And the last phase is to monitor and report, which simply means repeating our measurement phase periodically to ensure that our implementation phase is working and their environmental impact is reducing or our social impact is improving. This is the process that we now apply with our students in all of our training programs, but also we apply it to our own company. So let me show you this method with a practical example. For me, it always makes more sense with practical examples. When I was the green manager at Hotel Doolan, I noticed that our breakfast chef used to arrive every morning around 6 a.m and turn every single machine in the kitchen on, even those machines that he would not use until later. When I asked him about it, he said that was his routine. It's what he had done all his life as a chef. He would turn everything on ready for a busy day ahead. And quite honestly, I couldn't blame him. He'd never seen our electricity bills. Nobody had ever told him to do anything different. But through the measurement phase, I had found out that the main oven in the kitchen used 38 kilowatt hours of electricity. And I knew that our electricity unit price was 15 cents per hour. So I was able to calculate that if we were to turn off that oven for just one extra hour a day, every single day, we would reduce electricity use by nearly 14,000 kilowatts, which would save us over 2,000 euros in one year. 
this was just one machine off for an extra hour a day, which may seem like a really small thing to do, but can generate really good results. And that's how the 50 shades greener method works. We measured the energy use of our oven. We observed our chef's behavior around the use of that equipment. We then devised a training plan for the chefs to implement new procedures to turn machines on and off. And then I continue measuring our electricity use to ensure that it was indeed reducing. Within two years of the start of our green journey at Hotel Doolan, we had reduced our energy use by 30%, waste production by 40% and water use by 25%, simply by changing our team's behavior around the use of resources. And can you imagine what those reductions meant in terms of financial savings to our hotel? We've all been born in countries where natural resources like oil, gas and water, they're readily available to us. It doesn't matter how much we use, as long as we're willing to pay for it. We don't have to think twice about waste because we put it in the bin and it disappears as if by a magic trick. These privileges we were born with had made us form our current behavior and we have forgotten the correlation between our daily use of utilities and the environmental damage that they're causing in the planet. When we achieved those results at Hotel Doolan, I realized that running a green hospitality business was not just a nice thing to do. It is in fact the smart thing to do. Reducing your impact on the environment by reducing energy, waste and water is good for the planet, but it's also good for your pocket. And this was my light bulb moment, you could say. The moment I realized that I needed to share what I had learned with the rest of the world whether they wanted to listen to or not. In 2017, I finally took the plunge and I founded 50 Shades Greener as an environmental education company for the hospitality sector. My imposter syndrome, however, really took hold of me for the first few years as the CEO of an educational company. How could a person without a proper degree teach anything to anyone? I've always wanted to be able to speak in a more flourished or professional manner. I grew up in a household where speech and grammar were absolute most haves. But with English being my second language, once again, I was left feeling inferior and I doubted my programs would be good enough. Surprisingly, it is my everyday language, colloquial terms and even my own shortcomings of English grammar that it started attracting students to my programs and me in particular. The feedback I was hearing was, I love the directness of the lessons. It's just pure action-based learning. Or you make it all sound so easy, I feel I can do it. After my initial shock, I realized that it was not my language or my teaching methods that needed to change. It was my own mindset. For years, I had created this narrative in my own head that I was not good enough. And the only person that could change that narrative was me. Imposter syndrome is more common than many people think. I wonder if there are any other founders listening today that may have suffered too. However, it is only one of the many obstacles that founders and entrepreneurs will encounter, particularly when working from rural areas. One of my biggest barriers at the beginning of my own business journey was this connection and loneliness. And while loneliness is a state of mind, we can't underestimate the effects it can have when you're trying to bring your idea to a reality. A great entrepreneur is not necessarily going to make a great CEO. There are many aspects of a business journey that are not exactly what you want to be spending your time doing. Yet, they're absolutely necessary to build a successful business. So the top tips I've learned over the past four years are number one, always be kind to yourself. What you're doing is amazing. Maybe not to everyone, but it's amazing because you're realizing your dreams. Follow your instinct when making big decisions. Even when the results are not what you expected, be true to yourself and learn from your failures. Stay connected, particularly when setting up a business in rural areas. Network with intent so you can build your own community. Find other businesses in your local areas and speak to their managers or their founders 
surround yourself with mentors and advisors as much as possible. Research what funding and help is available to you. The LEADER program, for example, is an European initiative set up to assist the development of communities in rural enterprises. But like LEADER, there are many other sources of help available in your local community. Always be open to listen and learn. Even if you don't follow someone's advice, you can learn lessons from every single person you come across. And continued learning is the only way to remain on top of your game. And when the time comes to start building your team, always put them first. Your team will make or break your business. They shouldn't be viewed as a cost to the business. They are indeed your best assets. Treat them as you would like to be treated and build a company that everyone wants to work for. So let me end with the benefits of building a sustainable business. First and paramount is the ethical thing to do, at least in my opinion, and that kind of allows me to sleep better at night. When it comes to environmental sustainability in business, it can generate huge cost savings from becoming resource efficient. And I'll just show you an example there with our oven in Hotel Doolin. Another benefit is that Booking.com released a report to stating that 87% of global travelers want to travel more sustainably. Running a sustainable tourism business will attract a carbon conscious traveler. A business that puts sustainability at its forefront will increase its reputation from the local community, but also from all stakeholders. When it comes to embedding social sustainability into your business model, you will enjoy the benefits of a staff retention which at the end generates cost savings from not having to recruit new people and spend time training them. It also increases the staff productivity. A happy employee will perform at least 1.5 times better than an unhappy employee. And the most important thing is that you will build a team of people that are happy to be working together to achieve a common goal, the goal of making your business a success. It might seem like an odd thing to hear in the business world, but when we put people and the planet at the forefront of our business strategies, we can generate more profit and build a future that we're proud of. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn my camera back on now to take any questions. I love questions, so ask me anything you like. Uh, Raquel, uh, fantastic. Listen, thanks very much for that. Um, and and <laughs> touch wood, we, we, we stayed in touch with you, so that's great. Um, and I suppose your experience of the tsunami, uh, what's outside at the moment, uh, seems like nothing, I'm sure. Um, a, a very quick, um, a, a very ju just a few observations. Um, uh, I think you focus quite a bit there, uh, we'd say, in terms of your own journey on, on the emotional and the personal aspects of starting a business. And I know more and more um, from lots of different people that we talk to that this is essential. Um, you know, we always look at the importance of team um, when we're looking at projects and, and I do some other activity on, on private investment and, and that whole aspect of team and the skills and capabilities of the people and surrounding yourself with people. And you mentioned that their network with intent, uh, you know, speak to people, mentors and advisors and learning from people around you is, is a very, very important part because, um, you know, while you have the grow and the interest and, and the desire to do something in terms of a business, you know, you, you don't always have the skills at the start, so you've got to learn as you go on. So, so that was very good to, to, to find out about and, and to hear. Um, just a few things, maybe just to tease out a little bit more uh, from you, and if, if you don't mind sharing these a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll come in a moment to, we'd say, where businesses maybe miss opportunities to do simple things. And I know your offerings, you've got a range of offerings. So, you know, maybe can you just reflect slightly on, on sort of where people miss opportunities? I know you've alluded to it, but can you give us some maybe more examples of where people miss opportunities to do something effective, you know, without a great degree of difficulty or challenge in terms of the day-to-day -day stuff that they do? And then maybe can you go on a little bit and just explain what your offerings are? Because I know you've got a range of offerings, uh, Raquel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 
I honestly believe a lot of people when they, you know, when they are fronted with the word sustainability in their business, you know, I, I, I think the majority of people want to do something about it, but they just don't know how. And I guess the first thing that everybody thinks of is throwing money at the problem, you know, and, and that's not only for SMEs, it's even for the large corporations, they just throw money at the issue and decide to donate to plant trees, you know, um, and I think we all miss all those small things that we can do, not only at work, but in our daily lives to really, you know, start changing our behavior around the use of utilities. Um, and this is a big, big issue because, as I said in the presentation, I, I really do feel that because we have been born with these commodities, you know, it's never been an issue for us to obtain water. It's not the same in many other countries in the world. There is 1.7 billion people suffering water scarcity every single day. That's 25% of the world's population. But somehow, because we don't see that with our own eyes, you know, we don't actually see it as a problem. Um, when it comes with energy and waste, it generates a huge amount of carbon emissions. And again, it's our own behavior that is actually affecting the increase in carbon emissions. Obviously, we can't, you know, we can't be in charge of everything. We can't fix everything. There is nothing we can do about drilling for oil and gas if our governments allow it. But the way I look at it, we all have a certain level of personal responsibility for climate change. Um, and I do believe that we can all do something to, to better our lives for environmental sustainability. And where people miss um, opportunities at work is to really you know, take a bit of time and a step back and look at all the systems and processes we have around the business. Do you know your equipment well? You know, how often did you analyze your utility bills? In my experience, 99% of managers get a utility bill, they pay it and they file it away, you know, without realizing the amount of information that that bill can give you about your consumption. So it really is about taking a step back, looking at starting with energy, waste, water. I mean, sustainability comprises so many things. I would always say start very small. Take one area, for example, take energy, look at your lighting, look at your equipment, look at your heating systems, your insulation. And then even to your own behavior and the behavior of your team around the use of energy and, and identify those really small opportunities for improvement that can amount to a lot over the space of a year. And in terms of our, of our own offering now, we are working with the hospitality industry still, but we have diversified to other markets. So we started in hospitality, obviously, because that's the industry I know and I love. Um, and it made sense for me to, to concentrate on that market. So for hospitality, we have a green business online program, which is actually fully funded for all Irish hospitality businesses by the Kildare and Wicklow Educational Training Board. So any business can apply for our training delivered online or in company training. We train every member of the organization, even through the online program, and it's fully funded, so there is no charge at all. Then we also have the Green Manager program, which is our offering for hospitality students or people that want to you know, change their career and become green managers of the industry. We've actually just, we haven't announced it yet, but we actually have built the first qualification for environmental sustainability in hospitality in the world. We've done this in the UK um, simply because Ofqual was a lot more, um, I guess, um, easy to change and adjust to our methods than um, the framework of education here in Ireland, QQI. So from January now, anyone taking our Green Manager program can get a level four award certificate in the UK, which equates to a level six here in Ireland. And then we diversified throughout the pandemic, we moved on to um, build a schools program because everything we teach is around behavioral change around resources. And I realized that I was trying to teach adults for three or four years how to change a behavior that they have formed over 30 or 40 years of their life. Um, and how much easier would it be if I could teach students at a younger age how not to form those bad behaviors. So we've run a program with um, the educational training boards as well for three and a half thousand students of secondary schools. We had students as young as 14 and as old as 18. Um, so that was for the last term. And now we've just started to roll it out again um, from today, actually, <laughs> we started it. And the last thing we've just developed are all industries um, employee awareness program. So this is B for any industry, any company that wants to upskill their own employees on carbon emissions management um, and climate action as, as a collective for the company. 
so they're kind of the three the three markets that we're in. You could say all markets now. Once once our um, our last um, program is released, now we've we've released the first module of it, and the full program will be released from January. So that's that's more or less where we're at. And you say that's the only qualification. Available? Yeah, for for hospitality at the moment for environmental sustainability. Uh, no, did I hear you right? Globally, is that or? or... Yeah. 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 Oh, fantastic. Great there is no this. other level four certificate for environmental sustainability in hospitality, but the qualification we just built. So yeah, that was that was a long, hard process that I didn't enjoy at all. It's one of those <laughs> things you have to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose that's again the sort of the skill set and, and that you have to develop and work on over over time. But no, that's that's a fantastic achievement. Congratulations. Um, a couple of questions or uh, other questions are coming in here, uh, Raquel um, and uh, Maeve Shoike. Um, uh, from others in the to fault you, Maeve. Um, Maeve is, is uh, asking a question. Um, how do you convince the owners? So I suppose, um, uh, and maybe I'm adding something to Maeve's question here, and I suppose there's an element to sort of run the sales cycle here uh, uh, as well, and sort of, you know, no, I suppose, do you, have a, do you have, do you find it difficult to get customers? So Maeve's question is um, two parts. Um, how do you convince owners and managers that this is the thing to do? And then how do you get staff to buy into the plan? So it's easier said than done. They're busy. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got other jobs. Do they just see this as another task? So the owners and managers and then the staff. So yeah. how do you do that? Very different approaches to both. Um, so owners and managers, unfortunately, pre-pandemic, I always led my marketing with the cost savings aspect of the programs because, to be honest, you can't expect everyone to be as interested or invested in sustainability as other people. And so if you lead with the environmental hat, you know, you're not going to get a hotel owner really to, to, to engage with you unless they're, you know, very much a person that is aware of, of climate change and what's happening. Um, but that was pre-pandemic. I always led with the cost savings. However, post-pandemic, I have seen a massive shift in society um, and in all those business owners as well. Now they are more interested, not only in the cost savings, but around the environmentalism of, of our program and how to reduce their own impact on the environment. Let it be maybe from a marketing point of view or let it be because they have actually realized, particularly after the last IPCC report came out on climate change there a few months back, that really has sparked the interest of a lot of people to start getting in touch with us. Um, but it's not always, and easy sale to be honest you know you would think that something that is going to save you money and is good for the planet and is good for your team would be easier to sell but it's not um and then in terms of the staff yes um thankfully in hospitality a lot of our staff are um younger people they're the younger generations and to be honest it's a much easier sell for them than to the business owners or managers because they already have in built in them nearly like that they are the generation that is going to have to fix the wrongs that we have done in our past generations. And so um, convincing the staff is not as difficult as convincing the owners. You'll always get a cohort and, you know, I've done the maths on this, about 65, 70% of employees of a hotel always take on to the program like dogs to water. They love it, they want to implement it, and they go far and beyond to what we can teach them. And you'll always get a 30, 35% of them, let be maybe, you know, not to be ageist, but, you know, those that are a little bit older, particularly those that have been in the industry for maybe 20, 30 years, it is really hard to change those people habits. So, you know, the first thing that, you know, we, we do when we talk to our green managers about doing is having an open policy to listen to everybody and listen to everybody, even if they have neg negative things to say about the green program, but try really to get under the hood and find out why is this an issue for them? You know, what's what's the negative implications of them changing their behavior a little bit? Because a lot of the time you find answers like I'm already overworked. Um, I don't have enough hours to do what I have to do. And now you're telling me to do something different. 
And that's, again, you know, where you kind of start working on the social sustainability of your workplace. You know, if those people are so stressed that they can't even think about turning off the lights at the end of their shift, well, then you have a bigger problem than, than, than environmental sustainability. So it's about listening to people, be open to all type of feedback. And then, you know, if you can bring them to your side of the fence in terms of environmentalism, I always talk to green managers about implementing new procedures as a standard of procedure, write them into your SOP manual. This is now how you open the kitchen. This is how you close the kitchen. This is how you act during the day at all times with equipment, lighting. And once it's a standard of procedure, it's their job, you know, and whether they like it or not, they'll have to oblige somehow. Okay. So it's it's really like a, a change management project. And if you go to Cantor and Cotter and the likes of them and they talk about their eight or nine points, uh, communication is key and, and yeah. getting leaders is key and, exactly. and, and building that coalition of of, uh, of interested people is key. Um, and just uh, related to that then, um, so so we say actually getting in front of people. So and going back to a point you made on networks, um, developing your contact so what sort of networks did you tap into initially and, and was they what sort of networks so how and how has that evolved a little bit so um you know so what networks did you plug into to develop the contacts um you know, was it chambers of commerce tourism groups so on and and has that evolved and how has it evolved yeah, so the very beginning, I was blessed, really. I mean, um, here where I am in County Clare, we have the Boron Eco Tourism Network, which is a network of over 60 tourism businesses that all have a, an affinity and a remit to, you know, maintain the landscapes that all, all, all of our businesses rely on here in the Boron. Um, and so I knew it straight away 60 business owners. And to me, that was amazing because, you know, it's about... I guess, like not only being part of the network, but not being shy about making connections to those business owners and saying, hey, you know, I've just established my business and I wonder if you could have half an hour to have a chat with me, whether it's in person or online. Um, and really actually spend, you know, time nurturing those relationships, meeting them maybe every month at the beginning and trying to learn from them in every single call that you set up with them, because they set up their businesses maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. So they have a wealth of experience that I didn't have at the beginning. I also contacted my um, local, um, was a local, clear local development office because um, they offer again a lot of help in terms of assigning mentors to you if you need them. Uh, my local enterprise office, my Leo, again, I apply for mentorship there. Once I was about a year, a year and a half um, into the business, then I started, you know, looking, you know, a bit more into the likes of Enterprise Ireland and what they could offer me. So they put out a program called um, Female High Flyers, which was a program for female founders. Now, again, these are decisions that sometimes are hard to make as a business owner because this program took place in Dublin. I had to be in Dublin every Tuesday for um, 14 weeks, which meant I had to actually travel the day before, stay overnight in a hotel that is cost associated with that. I wasn't making any money. So all those decisions are hard to take. But all I can say is the more of these things you do, the more you learn, the more you become a better um, founder or CEO. And particularly, again, you know, I met 10 wonderful women in that program that I still connected with now on a monthly basis. We still meet up. We have online chats. We talk about the business and we share then things like, you know, where is funding coming available or, you know, who made a mistake and how did they make it and how not to make it again. So I would say start local with local networks, but then also look out to expand. And it is throughout that female founders um, course in Dublin that I have found most of my business mentors going forward um, just through you know, um, we used to do a lot of kind of um, speed dating with uh, different mentors or different founders in the program. And I've kept in touch with as many of those people as I could. Um, so, yeah, it's it's time consuming. I'm not going to lie. Um, and sometimes it might seem like a silly exercise because it's not an exercise that is going to make you money. You're not making sales when you're chatting to people. But it's the only way that you're always going to stay on top of your game. Um, and people talk, people know people. So I would always say make time for people as much as possible. 
Great. No, that's fantastic. And uh, I suppose just related to that, a uh, question from my own colleague, Mary Ryan, um, uh, and she was just picking up on your point, uh, you're a great entrepreneur, not necessarily going to be a great CEO. Um, so that's, you know, you've obviously highlighted, you know, uh, I suppose you had, I'm putting words in your mouth now, but, you know, some somewhat of a, an inferiority complex or you doubted yourself at an early stage. Um, and I think the recognition of that, you know that there are gaps and there are flaws you know mm. you can see wh where to work so mary is just asking uh, any directions for entrepreneurs on that issue i mean i suppose being open as one and recognizing and you've alluded to talking to people but is there any other one or two quick points on that that you think are, are important and and the team you mentioned as well building people around you mm. Yeah, I guess, you know, the very first thing to do in my mind would be to to build a list of your strengths and a list of your weaknesses, you know, and then try and try and see where you can find help in those weaknesses, particularly at the beginning where you can't afford to pay people to to help you fill those roles and you still have to sort of fill them yourself. Um, but like that, contact your local enterprise office or your local development office, because more times than not, they have mentorship available for a lot of the business roles that you might not be good at, like, you know, accountancy, for example. Um, but yeah, it's really just recognizing, recognizing what your what your weaknesses are and um, trying to find solutions that you can afford at every stage of the journey. Obviously, you know, at the beginning, I apply for a lot of free mentorship. Um, then a couple of years into my journey, when I started to make money, the first thing I did before I even paid myself is I hired my first team member. And I started paying them a salary because I knew that if I wanted to scale the business, I had to have people with me. You can't you can't run an international business on your own. It's, you know, well, no, you can't. <laughs> I was going to think of an example, but you can't. So that was the first thing I did. And my husband even thought I was crazy because he runs his own company with employees. But he was saying, why are you paying her without even paying yourself? And I thought, well, I have you to pay the mortgage at the moment. So let me build the business, you know. Um, and then within 18 months, I, I, I have now seven employees. So... It was a good move at the time, risky, but one that I could take. And I understand not every founder can take those type of risks because you may have a mortgage to pay. You may have, you know, you have to leave. Obviously, you can't leave a thin air. But I would always say investing on your team, um, it's, it's, it's the best business decision you can do. Right now, even in my team of seven, we all get paid the same because nobody's job is more important than the other, not even my own. Um, if it wasn't for them, I wasn't being able to do what I do. And so, you know, that's one of the things that we do is, you know, everybody gets paid the same. That we bring in consultants sometimes when I need them, uh, but they get paid the same as my team. And if they don't like it, then we don't work with them. So it's about making those kind of decisions and sticking to them, whether, you know, sometimes they go right, sometimes they go wrong, but um, yeah, asking for help, it's 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 a big one you know and, and nobody wants to admit that you need help nobody wants to admit that you don't know how to do something but it's it's the easiest way it's the fastest way to get to your end goal which is to get the job done <laughs> yeah. um again you know you're talking about stuff there and i have so many other questions that i could ask you that come up uh, and and so many other things that that you touch on and i think you know uh you know being paid the same as your employees you know, it's right in the middle of so many conversations that are happening now. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're talking sort of, you know, um, gender gaps, but not only gender gaps. I think I think what you're showing there is, is, is you know, a, a real innovative type of leadership. Um, so, you know, your talk has touched on so many of the things we wanted to talk to uh, today. Um, you know, the... the uh, sustainability part of it, the female entrepreneurship journey, rural tourism, um, you know, intergenerational learning is another key topic of, of the next thing that we're going to highlight now, the NCIT project. But I think, you know, you've, you've, you've covered that, you know, very, very well in terms of, okay, learning, shared learning, shared knowledge and the power and the benefit that comes from that. Um, so you've touched on, on a huge amount of things, and as I say, that you're talking, uh, I'm thinking of so many other questions and things we could delve into, but um, 
uh, you know, nature has been kind to us, Raquel. Uh, you've managed to stay alive bar the first hiccup. So I'd like to thank you very much for your contribution this morning. Um, um, and if anybody, uh, maybe if you give your, maybe if you give us your email address, um, Raquel, yeah. if, if, if there are... Info at 50 shades greener dot I'll type it on the chat now in a minute. But yeah, anybody that has any questions, just contact me at any stage because um I love to share what I what I whatever I know. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. I think we have some people online that might be interested in tapping into you, just you know, they deal with lots of other groups and so on. Mm -hmm. So th there could be something there that could be useful. So um Raquel, again, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you're you for having to, me to, to stay with us for a while. We'll be uh Going in now, just briefly to a presentation on one of the projects that I mentioned earlier, the Insight Tea project, and we'll be taking a break then around noon for about 10 minutes for a comfort break and a quick coffee. So, um, Raquel, thank you very much. And, thank you for uh, having me on. <laughs> you're very welcome. We're delighted to have you. So, thank you. Um, I might just progress on, folks, now to uh, just demonstrate um, one of the projects that we mentioned. Uh, you'll see it there in the background. Um, over my shoulder, uh, the Insight T uh, project, uh, and I'll just share uh, it on screen with you. So, if you bear with me, there's there's a few a few versions of this that that uh, that I that I'll share. So, Neve, if you're in the background there, you might uh, alert me to the fact if uh, that you can see all of this. So, um, yeah, all okay. Yeah, okay, so no more about our project. So the Insight Tea project, what's it all about? It's it's a European project uh, funded by the uh, European Commission uh, through the Erasmus Plus project. Um, and the idea behind this project is to support those people who have an interest in uh, setting up rural tourism businesses. Okay, so there's, there's a few different elements to that. Um, primarily uh, female founders uh, is, is what we're looking at. Um, rural tourism in uh, well, tourism in rural areas. Okay, so underpopulated uh, areas across Europe uh, is what we're looking at. We're also looking particularly um, in that rural tourism area. We're looking particularly at cultural and heritage and language based projects. Okay, so projects that focus those elements that build on elements of culture, heritage and language. Uh, that's another focus for, for the project. Project. And another uh, area we're looking at is this, this whole issue of intergenerational learning. So how can we take knowledge, learning, skills, experience, etc., uh, from people that have, um, have you know, a wealth of information that is otherwise at risk of being lost? Uh, and how can we preserve, conserve it uh, for future generations? And how can we generate something from it, uh, a return from it? So uh, we had partners from uh, Portugal, three partners from Portugal. We had partners from Estonia, from Romania, and ourselves, Westbeck here in Ireland. And I'll just uh, briefly demonstrate to you what we've developed out of this um, as, a, as a result of, of the last two years of, of activity. So what I've got here is um, just the homepage, uh, just to show you by way of example. Uh, and if anybody's interested, uh, we can put it up in the chat. Uh, we, we put in the, uh, the, the, the uh, address for the, for the web page and people can go and have a look. But it's the insighttproject.eu. Uh, and uh, general landing page here, you'll find out a little bit of information on the project, um, the outputs that we've developed uh, as part of it. Uh, so there's uh, six key outputs here. So we've developed uh, a curriculum, multimedia best practice. So uh, in Ireland, uh, for example, uh, as in all countries, we've developed two videos of promoters demonstrating elements of rural tourism, intergenerational learning, et cetera. Um, and we have uh, two um, projects from Ireland, uh, Anne McMonigal from uh, Glen Doan uh, in Crafts, and she's based up in Donegal, up in Inishon, uh, and she spoke about uh, learning from her mother, her family, and how she's preserved you know, traditions around weaving, uh, knitting, crocheting all of those types of skills and has revived and maintained and preserved them uh, and is now uh, creating a business for herself uh, on, on the basis of that um, and we'll see uh, we'll hear from Catherine O'Grady Powers of Glen King Farm later on so there are two examples so each country has two examples of, of best practice 
Then we've got the learning materials in the course, uh, and we have uh, e-tools. Uh, so that's a, a structure in terms of how people can use this e-learning platform to um, learn more about rural tourism, intergenerational learning, and how they can work on a project. OK, and we have some guidelines from, for VT providers as well. So those organizations and agencies and individuals who work with these companies, um, we've got some guides for them in terms of how they can use the outputs and, and tools from the project as well. So that's just a, a quick uh, example of, of um, what's been developed. Information on the partners. Um, and then we can go to the courses section. So what I'll do is I'll skip out of this uh, here again. I. Uh, I can't go into it directly because uh, you won't be able to follow it. So I'll just stop sharing here and I'll go into another link. So Neve, uh, just if you can let me know, we should see welcome to the Inside T e-learning platform there. Yeah, perfect. Very good, thank you. So when you click on the courses section, um, you can have a quick look around and you'll be invited to register, okay? So um, you just simply fill out some basic details there um, and you will get a confirmation email back uh, fairly quickly to say uh, you're welcome to the platform and now you're free to have a look around, okay? So uh, when you do log in there, you'll come to this and it'll just talk to you uh, through how you can use the materials and, and the tools that we've developed, okay? So down at the bottom here, is this area, uh, the, the four outcomes that we've developed. So the first two across the top there are mainly around content. Okay, so uh, what are you talking about here, Alton, when you're talking about content? Well, as I said, uh, people who are interested in starting a rural tourism business, um, you know, potential entrepreneurs, they could be early stage or they could be um, older people uh, who maybe have worked in a business and now see an opportunity to create one for themselves or may have been laid off from a business and see an opportunity, or maybe are a bit older and you know, want a change of life. Um, Raquel alluded to it there. Um, you know, Post-pandemic, people are reevaluating what they're doing and how they're, they're doing it. So all of those types of people uh, could be interested in this. So um, the first part we go into is this area on self-assessment. Okay, so what do I know about this topic? All right, so there is a brief, and I'll demonstrate it at the moment, there's a brief... Um, uh, series of questions around the six modules. We've, we've developed six modules uh, as, as part of this project, and there's a self-assessment on each of those modules. So you go in, ask yourself some questions on, on various topics, and we generate a response. And that'll direct you then in terms of the learning that you should undertake. And then we've actually got the learning manual or the content here. So that's, uh, that's uh, material on the topics. Uh, you know, it's presented in a PowerPoint format, it's additional reading, uh, it uh, sets out some learning outcomes at the start, uh, and then uh, works through a series of learning activities. So as you're reading and understanding, then it asks you questions that helps you maybe probe or, or probes you and, and teases out, well, you know, what are you learning, what are you knowing? And then there's some useful material, uh, other links that you can log into, um, other case studies that you can see, and it just rounds off the, your, your, your learning and your knowledge. The other elements we've got then are the collaborative uh, elements. So here we've got a collaborative resource network. I'll demonstrate this in a moment. So here, essentially, you can um, get on here, create a profile of yourself, of your business. So Raquel, for example, may go on here, create a profile for herself in Fifty Shades Greener, and she can promote the various courses that she runs. She can maybe set up, um, you know, uh, an information stream. Um, she can maybe ask questions of people and she can share that with the other community uh, members who are on the platform. So as more and more people register from different parts of Europe, I mentioned we our partners are from Portugal, Estonia, Romania and Ireland, but this will be available to people across Europe when we're finished. Um, so there you can tap into other people uh, and you can, uh, you know, communicate with people openly to everybody, or you can determine uh, who you want to target specifically. 
Okay. And the last part then is here on the creative lab. And this is where you can work on your project, work on your business idea. So we've created a sort of a business plan wizard here, which I'll show you in a moment, uh, where you can work on aspects of your plan. So what's the opportunity? What's the problem? What's the idea? What's the competition? Have you done the finances for it? Okay. What's your sales and marketing plan going to be? And you can work on that. You can come back to it uh, over a series of iterations. And then when you feel that you're ready with it and it's ready to go, there's a facility here to uh, essentially print the business plan, which will bring it all together in a single PDF. And you're able to share that then with various people. OK, so there are the, the highlights of it. And I'll just click into them just very, very quickly, uh, just to give you uh, a, a demonstration of it. OK. So let's go into the course. It's yep. Yeah. OK, so here um, and Neve, uh, I'll talk. And if uh, if you don't see what I'm talking about, maybe you can let me know. OK, so here's the self-assessment section. We've gone into it um, and you can do an overall self-assessment so you can uh, look at the six modules. So there's a, a series of questions which address all of the modules that we've done, or you can do it on a module basis. So module by module. So as I said, six modules. Uh, they are sustainable tourism. Uh, the next one is intergenerational learning and entrepreneurship. The next one is around knowledge transfer and sharing information between and within generations. Um, the next one is sharing and discussing best practice documentaries. Then we have innovative business in low density territories and cultural heritage preservation. And the last one then, the last module is the business plan uh, and individual and mentoring approaches to that. So for argument's sake, uh, you're interested in the intergenerational learning and entrepreneurship one. You click on that. It will invite you to attempt the quiz or in my case here, re-attempt the quiz. So if we click on this, and I deliberately picked a short one here, uh, there are a series of questions. Now in this one here, there are only three questions. Okay, but in some of the other modules, you have maybe eight to 10 to 12 questions. Okay, so you read the questions, you answer them as best you can. I'm just going to answer them randomly here just to demonstrate how it works. So I've answered the question. I say finish my attempt. And I say submit all and finish. And here in the top right, we see that uh, this operates on a traffic light system. OK, so I didn't get any red answers here, so I didn't get any wrong answers here. But uh, if you get an answer wrong, it'll come up as red. Uh, in this case, two of them are amber. So that indicates, well, you know some information, but you need to do a bit more work on it. And the third one is green. You know this, you don't need to do any more. So it gives you an idea of, of your, your level of knowledge on the topic. OK. It uh, gives you a little bit of commentary on, on what the, the, the results are. And then at the bottom here, it says, go to the learning material. OK, so based on the uh, res results that you've um, received, uh, this will direct you to the material that you should um, work on. OK, so I won't go through, through the link here, but I'll go back here and I'll go into the learning content. So this is the course. So the format is the same for all of the material. And here again, you've got each of the modules. So let's stick with this one on intergenerational learning and entrepreneurship. And when we click on this, again, the format for all the modules is the same. There's a bit of information in terms of keywords that you'll be looking at. So key themes in the module, the learning objectives, and how long each module should take you. Then we've got the material itself, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, and learning activity submission. So in each of the modules, there may be three or four learning activities. So questions that you're asked about what you've been reading. Um, and it invites you to, uh, you know, to reflect and submit uh, an answer on, on that area. Useful links, summary of the key points, uh, best practices, so case studies and the video documentaries that uh, we've suggested that you look at. Um, so you go through that process, read up, understand it, probe, challenge yourself in terms of what you know, what you don't know, 
and then you can move on to progress onto a project. And here, for example, is just the way that the material is laid out. Uh, it's in a series of PowerPoint type presentations. So introduction just introduces you to the topic, uh, then tells you about, um, we'd say in this case, a finance module. Um, how do you um, develop tourism in, in, in rural areas, sustainable tourism in rural areas? And as you progress through this, through the content, you're reading, you're understanding, you're learning, and then you will be asked or you will be challenged in terms of learning activity. So a question will be put to you, you know, what do you think of this? How would you go about this? How would you progress a situation like this? How would you deal with this challenge? So as I say, that's common to all of the modules. So going through each of these, people are learning, educating themselves, improving their knowledge to the extent that when they're finished, uh, and when they've undertaken, as Raquel outlined, you know, uh, we'd say networking with people and talking to people and engage with mentors and entrepreneurs, uh, other entrepreneurs and trainers, that they'll then be in a position to start their own business. So that's the format for the learning material. And then if we go to the collaboration space, Here, as I said, is where we're hoping that we get a community of users from all across Europe. So this is really where you can put up, you know, a whole load of different activities. Uh, so for, for argument's sake, it could be Raquel. Again, let's take Raquel and she's talking or thinking about a new service that she's planning to launch or make available. And she might put that up here and, and ask members of the community, well, what do you think of this? You know, would it work? Would people be interested? What should it feature, et cetera, so forth. Uh, or it could be somebody, somebody saying, you know, where do I get support for uh, this aspect of my business? I'm thinking of putting in a ticketing machine. Uh, does anybody have experience of that, et cetera, so forth. So you can put up information here, ask questions uh, and get the community to, to respond. So if I just show you here, open forum. And here, for example, uh, we've just been piloting this uh, here. You'll see uh, myself, Alton Farty. I didn't finish the profile. I didn't put up a, a picture. But here you can start a, a question or start a thread. You can add a new discussion and you can go in and you can decide whom amongst the rest of the community can see this. And you post the question and you'll get feedback on it then. So as I say, it's a collaborative space where people can, can talk to each other about ideas, about opportunities, about challenges, about problems, uh, and, and work together and work through issues. And then the last part then is the, uh, the, uh, the business plan or the creative lab. So when you go in here, this is a space where you can actually work on, on a project, okay? Um, so there's you, you have to log in here, uh, create a login, then you'll get access to the business plan wizard that's available. Uh, and here you'll see business plan and pitch, and this is the next piece I'm going to show you, the last piece indeed that I'm going to show you. Uh, you can click on this uh, here and you can work on your business plan. So I'm going to have to just exit out of this uh, here. Um, and hopefully that's going to work well. So, Neve, I'm not too sure if you can maybe advise me. Are you seeing dashboard there, Neve? No. No. Okay. It may not uh, may not work. I've had challenges. Just doesn't flow too well. But essentially, I'll just try it once more. Has it come up now, Neve? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. That's great. Um. Yes. 
So here then is, is, is the last part of it. So it's the business plan wizard. So for example, uh, you, know, you can get in here, you can create a business idea, you can work on the business plan. Let's see if this works if I go to the business plan. So here's the wizard, okay? Uh, so here are areas that you can work on. So market opportunity uh, might be the first one that you want to, to work on. So you can click on this. Uh, you've got uh, an option there where you can go in and you can put in some information on this around, you know, well, describe the market opportunity, what is it? Um, so you can work on that, uh, do it, come back, uh, work on it uh, on a few different occasions um, and refine the idea as you're progressing, okay? Uh, you might uh, then decide, well, uh, what I want to do is maybe have a look at the, uh, at the financials, okay? Uh, so again, you work on the financials here, uh, you enter some information on them uh, and uh, you know, construct the first part of your, your business plan and uh, consult with people, take advice, do a bit of research, and then maybe you can come back and work on it again. So there you've got uh, nine elements of the, of the, the, the business plan, um, a few key headings, as I say, uh, market opportunity, the problem, solution, route to market, uh, team, financials, resources required, etc. So that's the wizard there. And as I say, once you've worked uh, on the wizard uh, and you can come back uh, and work on it at different intervals, uh, once you've got the information and you're happy that this is ready to go and it's ready to share with people, there's a button available that you hit. It creates a PDF uh, version of it, brings all the information together, and that's something then that you can share with key uh, key people. So that's just a quick overview, everybody, of the Insight T project. Um, I think we're sort of yeah, we're just over uh, slightly over time. Um, so what I'll do is maybe if people have questions uh, that they want to put to me, I'll take them in the chat. Um, um, and I'll, I'll come back to people directly on them. So let's maybe try to keep the time. And I think, Neve, we're on a coffee break now at the moment. Uh, and we're yep. back in at, let's say, at maybe 12 minutes past. Let's take 10 minutes. Um, and we'll come back around 12 minutes past 12. And we'll have an introduction to the W Power uh, project. So is that OK, Neve? Yeah, that's perfect. Great. OK, so see you all, everybody, in, in about 10 minutes. Thank you very much.
hi everybody uh, i think we're back on um hopefully people are, are with us um so i think the next element is the presentation on the w power project so alison my colleague i see you're on screen here so alison i might hand over to you and let you do just a quick introduction and to welcome i won't try and pronounce her, her surname but to welcome helena uh, from the W Power Project uh, to just give us an overview. So, uh, Alison, I'll hand it over to you. Brilliant, Alton. Thank you very much. Um, as Alton says, I also work at Westpac here, and we are the Irish partner on the W Power Project. So, I'm joined by my colleague Helena from Finland. She works at the Karelia University, and they are the lead partner on this project. So, Helena, I'll give the floor to yourself to give a brief introduction to W Power. Now I got to mute, mute off. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. And good afternoon, everybody. Or it's basically noon there, but uh, late afternoon already here in Finland, two hours, dear friends. I will share my screen to show you some PowerPoint slides. So uh, indeed, my name is Helena Puhakka-Tarvainen. and I'm the project leader of W Power. I'm situating in Joensuu, the easternmost Finland, and I'm working for the Karelia University of Applied Sciences. And let's see. Yes, next slide. Uh, w Power has been about empowering women entrepreneurs in sparsely populated communities, as we are funded from the Northern Periphery and Arctic program, uh, so especially the challenges of sparsely populated areas has been one of our main targets during the project. We have been aiming for equal growth and increase in the contribution of women to regional economy in sparsely populated northern and arctic communities. I thought I had the list of the participants here it is. So uh, we're <clears throat> working in basically six, seven regions. So here in easternmost Finland, as well as in the Finnish Lapland, our partner has been Lapland University of Applied Sciences. Uh, we are working in uh, northern Sweden, in Norrbotten. Uh, Strukturum is the organization there. Uh, in Scotland, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the Pure Energy Center in Shetland. And they're in Ireland, uh, West Peak. We also had a partner in Iceland, Innovation Center Iceland, but as the organization was finishing its operations this year, they are not anymore involved. And then we have a very active associated partner in New Brunswick, Canada, the local association for promoting women entrepreneurship so common challenges in the north uh, sparse population and so on but different regions in scandinavia british isles and canada so as said uh, we have had similar challenges which are sparse population lower economy than on average huge out migration especially well-educated women have tended to out migrate from the regions and that's why we have had gender imbalance and that's why we have been promoting community development and vitality equal opportunities and better business services i talk here on the past uh, talk because this is the last month of the project so we started in 2018 and we are now finishing our operations so that's why most of the activities have been done already uh, the background was also that there were some challenges for female entrepreneurship women are less likely than men to be entrepreneurs in all regions are more likely to work part-time and more likely to work in service sector. Sorry, there was an animation. I will go back. And that's why the women are earning less in general. So that has been one of the background assumptions that uh, how to motivate the woman to become entrepreneurs, earn more, 
earn maybe full time and other sectors than service. And also women are more likely to face challenges around accessing finance and business support, engaging with role models, networks and mentors. Basically, you can't be what you can't see. And there are also cultural assumptions and gender stereotyping we have noticed. Um, in some of the regions, we have also worked with uh, indigenous people, like in uh, here in Finland and Sweden, we have a, a Sami minority in the regions, and also we have cooperated with the immigrants, women, and uh, promoted their entrepreneurship. Uh, we have been working for improvement of the regional business environments with networking, uh, organizing information sessions, um, listening the women entrepreneurs or what, uh, women who want to be entrepreneurs, which kind of challenges they have faced and try to tackle them. Uh, we have uh, conducted regional and transnational learning, so learning from each other, but also uh, learning from experts. Uh, we have piloted gender sensitive business coaching. And also we have a piloted an innovation platform for raising up new startups. Our target groups have been women entrepreneurs, startups, women leaders, business advisors, and potential future entrepreneurs, for example, uh, students here, especially as we are university, so our students has be, have been a target group. But the common factor is the sparse population and northern communities. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we have offered information and support, networking possibilities, training and learning, peer to peer mentoring, business coaching, innovation workshops, and platform for new business ideas. Alison will tell more about the project outcomes, what we have reached, but there are a few pictures of the transnational thematic weeks. We managed to organize these pictures, for, for example, from the Jokmok in northern Sweden, uh, there is a Sami tradition uh, vocational school. So the students there are uh, learning the skills, for example, how to uh, make uh, traditional clothing and how to sell them. Uh, of course, the COVID has affected our activities, but luckily uh, we have been uh, reaching our target groups also online. So more than 500 women have been participating in our activities across the regions. So we have had regional hubs for networking, training and support. Uh, we have organized these transnational workshops and events. We have a lot of newsletters and publications. So if you are interested, uh, feel free to go to our website, www.wpowerproject.eu. All our outcomes are to be found there. We have, for example, podcasts, booklets, videos, and of course, our social media, especially Facebook has been active and LinkedIn group is for networking, but I bet Alison tells more about that. Uh, you may contact me also after this month. I'm, of course, uh, holding the legacy of this project uh, from now on. So feel free to ask questions. And we are, of course, hoping to organize more activities, maybe in the form of other projects. So this is a group picture taken in Sweden in November 2019. A lot of project staff, but also women entrepreneurs across the regions. So thank you for this possibility to introduce Develop Power and please continue, Alison. Brilliant, Helena. Thank you very much for the introduction. And as you alluded to, I will share my screen and talk to some of the, the outputs and outcomes that we've achieved over the last three years. So that should be popping up now. Yep. 
So following on from what Helena said, there has been many outcomes and outputs of the project. Um, I will touch on the four that she has mentioned already that are part of the four separate work packages that we worked on. First up, yeah. So, sorry, my, my computer's skipping a little bit there. So regional forums for empowering female entrepreneurs. This was the first work package we looked at, and I suppose that was the main outcome of it. However, a lot of research uh, and uh, investigating on, went on behind the scenes. So initially we set out by doing a baseline report. This was carried out in all project regions. And basically it was um, finding uh, and getting the, the states or the existing state of female entrepreneurship in those regions back in 2018. And a lot of the findings um, were quite similar across the regions. Um, to do with, first of all, just the, the rural uh, elements and also the female entrepreneur side of it. So, for example, it was found, and I know Helena mentioned briefly as well, some of these findings, but I'll, I'll quickly skim through them just as this was the basis for a lot of the activities that were then undertaken as part of the project. So, for example, it was found as uh, that the female entrepreneurs tend to be more part-time um, and it's often seen as a temporary career solution. Sometimes this is due uh, quite often to the, the fact that they take up the caring responsibilities in family settings and so on. And it's also just seen as not a viable way um, to make sustainable income. So quite often it's, it's seen as temporary. Also, um, doesn't come as a surprise to most of us on the call here today, there's um, fewer female uh, investors and um, venture capitalists, um, and that's something here in the West of Ireland we're, we're very much trying to change. Um, you know, other aspects such as women questioning their own abilities, their skill sets, the, um, their confidence and general business knowledge um, in comparison to their male counterparts who are much more confident in what they do. Um, however, saying this, it was found that a lot of the female entrepreneurs actually have a higher educational level um, in terms of, you know, master's degrees and so on. However, they still have this uh, lack of confidence in their, their soft skills and so on. Um, so, you know, a lot of these findings, time and time again, doesn't come as a surprise to ourselves, having been in this area of female entrepreneurship. One um, key finding and challenge for the females in all these regions was the access to funding. And again, this can be seen that Females tend to have shorter uh, credit histories, you know, and access to assets such as home ownership. So a lot of the times, um, financial institutions quite often don't or give limited amounts of funding to, to entrepreneurs. And this was seen as a, a challenge and something that needed to be addressed going forward. So essentially, that's, uh, I suppose, a brief overview of the, um, the report and what that found. And as I say, that was then the basis for a lot of the activities that were carried out then as part of the project. So following on in this work package, um, a lot of regional stakeholder workshops took place similar to today. Um, the aim was bringing together anyone, whether it be institutions, third level um, colleges, um, business support organizations, bringing those together if they had the, the mindset of um, empowering women and uh, I suppose driving female entrepreneurship, bringing those together, sharing the ideas, um, just knowing what each other does and what they do about sometimes there isn't a joint up approach. Um, so this was kind of the, the aim of those workshops. And that was also done on a transnational setting, um, which was very beneficial. You know, even the partners ourselves, sometimes we would see that, oh, they're doing this in Sweden. Let's bring that back here and incorporate it in what we do. So then information sharing events similar again were carried out over the three years. So to wrap up this work package, I suppose the main forum, um, networking forum that was established was the W Power LinkedIn group, which Helena mentioned. We currently have over 180 members who are quite active. And there's, you know, this consists basically of posting of uh, meetups, opportunities that are coming, funding opportunities, similar to what Alton and Raquel talked about, you know, that network that is essential, especially for female entrepreneurs. So as you can see on the right there, we have a meetup, at a coffee break on Thursday. Um, so there's still lots of little, you know, meetups and that happening. And it's, I must note that it's, it's not um, closed at the moment. We're still taking on members and uh, hopefully that will uh, 
continue after the project lifetime also. So we will, um, I'll post up the, the information for contacting us again later. Um, if you do, if this is of interest to yourselves. Um, it should be mentioned that in Scotland, we had a very good pilot group there. Our Sc Scottish partners had a Slack group. Um, so again, it was trying the different platforms and what worked best for the entrepreneurs. And this was highly um, successful in their region. Again, flagging up any local opportunities that were coming their ways, having the female entrepreneurs just share tips and advice with each other. So again, great um, outputs from, from that work package. The next one, we um, the main output was the transnational learning program for the female entrepreneurs. Essentially, we started out by doing the, the initial scoping or a pre-survey, which mapped the specific needs um, for upskilling and capacity building of the female entrepreneurs in these regions. And again, we found very similar um, challenges, benefits and so on, and just similar experiences across the region. Um, for example, I know that um, that came from, uh, you know, the inputs that the, the females had experienced and there was 178, I think, if I'm not uh, wrong, respondents in that uh, pre-survey. And again, a lot of the rural challenges came up just like we had today here in Ireland with the storm. Um, the broadband, uh, the query about uh, not having strong enough broadband and uh, broad bandwidth. Um, in the west of Ireland or in these rural areas was seen as a challenge. Um, also, how the business uh, supports were very much urbanised um, and in tandem that meant that female entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in rural settings have to travel, their out expenditure costs and time and so on. However, you know, it can be argued now due to COVID that has slightly um, shifted, which is great. But there's all these key challenges that, that have came um, to light and really have made the basis for um, the, the, the rest of the activities and particularly the peer-to-peer -peer program that I'll mention now. So in Ireland, in the context of the Irish respondents, it came up that the number one uh, area that lacked um, the capacity building for female entrepreneurs was the, the networking, mentoring, and the um, role models um, you know, element. And that's something, again, that Raquel has alluded to at, the, at the, her presentation. These areas are key, you know, um, as Elena says, if you, if you can't see, you can't be. I think that's, you know, even a, a big thing here in Ireland in terms of sporting, uh, female sport and so on. Um, and it's came to the forefront in recent years that these role models are essential. So again, um, at Westwick then took this information and seen the need for workshops in these areas. I know a lot of you on the call today actually participated in these webinars. Um, and they were around negotiation skills, communication skills, dealing with difficult people. Um, and our last webinar was on imposter syndrome and resilience. So these soft skills seem to be um, key in terms of driving female entrepreneurship on in the region. And this was again done in a transnational setting as well. So as I mentioned, the peer to peer program was the, the main output. And I suppose the way we went about doing this as the, the project partners was we put out a call for applications for any females in, in all the, the eight areas or regions to apply. Of that, we got 42 applications. We then, based on this information that they provided us with, matched them up to other similar, you know, whether it be in terms of the same sector or the same skills um, or sorry, the same um, needs. We then matched these two entrepreneurs in different regions. Then they drew up a contract, what their expectations were for this and so on. And then the P2P networking um, took place. Now, unfortunately, due to COVID, it meant the entrepreneurs couldn't physically visit each other's business. However, they did so online. And I know we had 15 pairs or on occasion teams of three who carried this out um, and have found great benefit from it, benefits sorry, from it. As you can see on the right here, I have a screenshot just of um, one of our pairs and it's Pivy, our Swedish coordinator, um, overseeing this. So we have Megan at the bottom from Scotland and Anna from Finland who are paired up. And this again, you know, they, they really shared their experience in terms of how they benefited from each other's um, business processes, um, their ideas, their mindset and so on. Um, and they really, I suppose, took advantage of this um, opportunity 
by scheduling their meetings in advance, but also having the topic set out, you know, whether it be marketing this week, the next week branding, um, and the next week websites, maintenance, and so on. So that was very, very beneficial. The next work package, um, the main output was the gender sense of coaching concept. Westlake was over this package and we basically developed in tandem with our partners, a lot of models and tools that essentially help business advisors to better support the female entrepreneurs, um, those of which are from different demographics. For example, housewives, immigrants, um, indigenous women, uh, and the likes, maybe uh, young female entrepreneurs. So essentially these tools, and as you can see, there's, there's quite a list there, and I'll not go uh, drill into too much detail on them as they're quite, uh, quite comprehensive, but they are tools uh, which I suppose better equip these business advisors to approach um, and give equal opportunities to the female entrepreneurs. Um, things like, you know, posing questions like um, if their program or the coaching concept actually takes into consideration gender sensitive language um, and also stimulate participation in all genders. Does it, the timing um, and the place of it account for you know, the private life factors of all participants and give them equal opportunities to, to participate? Again, going back to the family scenarios um, and how sometimes female entrepreneurs have to work around this. So I'll just show one example of the, the tool. So again, it's given at the, the different phases different cues and prompts that the business advisors or any organization institution should take into consideration. Lastly, we have work package four, which had the main output of the innovation platform for new pre-startups. Again, we started this at the very beginning of the project by collecting the existing inventory of um, any business idea competitions, hackathons, incubators and the likes gathered this information together and seeing kind of which were the best practices, what worked well, what not so well, and then formed benchmarks. From this, we then piloted our own business competitions. So the first pilot um, was back in 2019, if I'm correct. Um, again, it was a, a real life functioning uh, competition um, and the winners received financial and mentoring supports. In between, we've done innovation workshops, just working on these ideas and what, what best works for female entrepreneurs. We had a second pilot. And then from all this, we got feedback from the participants, which you know really prompted to us what could be improved on, what is the best way to go about doing this. And eventually we, we had then an output of a short video just on how organizations or institutions can best go about setting up um, a business idea competition. So essentially it's a, a quick guide of all the factors that they need to take into consideration. So again, this was um, a key area that seemed to spark female entrepreneurship, whether it be early stage companies, students, female students, and so on. So this was seen as a great way to, um, to really drive a female entrepreneurship. So essentially, those are the four work packages that we worked through. As I said, there, there's a lot more than just what I've said in terms of the, the work that went on. Um, but really, that seemed to help the regions attract and promote female entrepreneurship. I'd also just like to mention that, um, and something that Helena briefly mentioned um, in her slides, was the W Power podcast. These um, are really, really uh, insightful podcast episodes from some of the participants and some of the partners in terms of those um, experiences that they shared and also um, you know, talking about the females uh, who set up businesses in the rural areas, they are now you know, thriving or you know, seeing real uh, differences in their, their business. So they talk um, very authentically in terms of how uh, they've got over the challenges in their areas. Um, and all of those women have been supported in one way or another through W Power. Season three, which has been just published or released today, also goes through just some of the, men, uh, the tools that I've mentioned um, in a little bit more in depth. So it could be of um, benefit or of uh, interest to anyone on the call today. So be sure to check them out. Um, and again, that is all from me um, in terms of a, a quick overview on the outputs that have been achieved. Um, as Selena says, we have our website, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, 
and all of these resources can be found there. Um, again, uh, my email address and Helen's email address is there and the podcast link. So please do reach out to any of us if, if you have interest or any questions in relation to the project. Thank you very much for listening to me today. And I will hand it back over to my colleague, Alton, as I know, I think uh, Catherine has joined us. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Catherine's there. Um, Alison, thanks a million for that. That's powerful. Um, and good stuff. We're, we're close on, on time. So that's powerful. We're, we're, uh, we're keeping to the agenda. So uh, just a quick reflection um, um, on, on that, Alison. And I think um, it's very interesting when we look at uh, Raquel and what she told us about her journey and her experiences and how it's reflected very much in, we'd say, the, the sort of the analysis that you've been going through and the outcomes that have been produced as a result of the W Power project, I just thought it was a very good, uh, very good demonstration of a lot of the issues that you're talking about. And Raquel then highlighting, um, would say how she's addressed a lot of these things and and as as working through them. Um, so we'll invite some questions uh, in the chat uh, and we'll maybe come to them uh, a little bit later. But we have Catherine O'Grady Powers with us from Glen Keane Farm. Catherine, you're very welcome this morning. Um, and uh, we're delighted you could join us. And, and hopefully uh, North Mayo is, is not too wild yet. Uh, so uh, we had Raquel Nabo on this morning, uh, high up on, on the cliffs of Moher, and, and she managed to stick with us for, for the presentation. So um, we're delighted you join us, Catherine. Um, I've already gone through um, a presentation earlier today on the Insight Tea project uh, and just telling people about that and, and you know, the focus around uh, female entrepreneurship and sustainability and intergenerational learning and how that all ties into rural tourism. So we're delighted that you could join us just to tell us a little bit about your story and your journey as well. Um, I've heard it. Uh, I've told everybody there's a video of you there as well uh, on the Insight T platform and people can get in and, and have, uh, have a look around it. So maybe I'll leave it to you, Catherine. Tell us a little bit about your journey and your experience and we'll take it from there then. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Elton, and, and sincere thanks to all at Westpick, Gurmila Mahagov, for inviting me to participate today. Um, I feel truly honored to be here. It's such a fantastic event, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to share a PowerPoint presentation on our journey um, for our rural business. So I'm going to screen share here now. Um, and what this does, it just gives a snapshot um, of the, the whole adventure of setting up our business here. So we are located between Lewisburg and Linan, um, just at the gateway to the lovely uh, Connemara region. So we're just at the mouth of the uh, Delphi Duloc Valley. Um, now I'm just going to check with somebody. You can, can you see? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's perfect. perfect. Yeah, that's that's okay. gone full screen, Catherine. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so Glenkeen is privately owned. Um, we're deeply rooted here with my own ancestors stemming back to the 1600s. And Glenkeen has a special designation. It's designated by the European Union as a special area of conservation for its ecological purity, natural beauty, and cultural heritage. Uh, there are multiple businesses under Glen Keane, but today I'm going to present on our visitor attraction, the Glen Keane Farm Experience. And Glen Keane is owned now currently by myself and my wonderful American husband, Jim, who has embraced life in the West of Ireland um, as, uh, as you do, uh, but uh, he still continues his uh, working in aviation over in the States. So, and this is our son, James here, he's six. So back in 2003, um, Jim and I started to look at sustainability of Glen Keane and the route forward to ensure that this beautiful place that has been entrusted in us uh, remains with us for future generations. And um, it's not without its challenges. We've seen 
highs and lows in terms of um, the activities that happen here at Glen Keane. So over 10 years and working with uh, closely with Mayo County Council, undertaken environmental impact studies, archaeological site surveys, uh, raising the capital and um, negotiating uh, different grant supports. And here I have to mention the leader grant support for rural tourism business under Southwest Mayo Development Company. Um, we were very fortunate to have received a leader grant for the construction of a state-of-the-art facility here at Glen Keane, which has a commercial kitchen, a dining space, lecture hall, a uh, craft shop and outdoor demonstration areas. And just to mention, in this rural setting, it's highly unlikely that we would have proceeded with this project had it not been for the support of LEADER funding. So a huge thank you to LEADER. And also we were supported by the local enterprise office here in Mayo um, for different uh, supports for our business, such as our digital platforms and setting up those necessary steps to promote our rural business. Now, what you're looking at here, folks, is a, a view uh, of Muilra. It's the tallest point in the region of Connacht at 814 metres. And this is a beautiful scene that our guests enjoy every time they visit us. As I mentioned, we are deeply rooted here. My ancestors set up as tenant farmers here under the British landlord in the 1600s. And um, they lived in harmony with 40 other families. Would you believe in the Valley of Glen Keane, there was almost a population of 400 people pre-famine. But of course, um, moving into the 1700s, there was an explosion in population and over-dependence on smaller holdings. And leading into the 1840s, then the blight caused the, um, the effect of the potato crops and, and there was an overdependence on the potato. Now, what we have here surrounding us at Glen Keane is the fingerprints of humanity and the constant reminder of the challenges and tribulations of the past where we have ring forts, we have the cluster village of tin and farm cabins that escaped the leveling of the evictions in 1847 that occurred here. And we have the landscape that acts as a living museum that we interpret our story and the story of the Irish famine in Ireland. And here I have a photo of the majestic Duloc Valley. Our property runs right through the Duloc Valley. There's a beautiful stone monument here in memory of the Irish famine victims. And this valley is also a prime example of the glaciers and the whole movement of the glaciers in carving out this majestic valley. It's one of my favorite scenes to this day. And I grew up here. This is a bird's eye view of the visitor center at Glen Keane. And it was pivotal that this building was in keeping in the tradition of our landscape. So we worked closely with Mayo County Council and they have fantastic consultation clinics. I have to say the advice we received was really second to none um, and with our engineers in achieving that. Um, and our experience. So what we did was we looked at uh, past activities here at Len Keane, current activities and what happens on a daily basis here at Len Keane. So we looked at those activities and we packaged those. And that's what we sell to tour operators uh, for their guests to come here and have an authentic tactile experience when they visit Len Keane and the west of Ireland. So I have listed here the number one attraction is our sheepdog herding experience provided by our friendly border collies and ship, shepherding is a cultural activity. It has been going on here for generations and all of that language of shepherding such as the verbal commands and the whistle commands has been passed down through generations. And we share that with our visitors and also the dog training programs, the type of sheep we farm, and that interpretation of the special landscape. Traditional turf cutting, we no longer um, are permitted to cut turf 
for consumption. However, we did receive uh, permission from the NPWS for demonstrations of turf cutting for our visitors. And we talk about the importance of our peatland habitats. Um, they, we have some of the pristine habitats in Europe, the intact peatland habitats. We also are part of the pearl mussel habitat, the endangered species. Uh, the pearl mussel lives for up to 50 years, and it's a testament to the pristine waters and environment that exists in this area. Traditional wool spinning and wool dyeing experience are delivered by our colleague and friend June Burke, and we provide private visits. The slide here, the photograph here, is the interior of one of the cabins here at Lankeen that escaped the evictions. And what you get here for the visitor is a very real, raw, emotional experience, because a lot of visitors that are coming here are retracing the footsteps steps of their ancestors and they want to find out more how they lived, the conditions they lived in and how they survived. Here we have our wonderful neighbour Johnny Kittrick, he's an awesome um, experience provider, he's a Shanos singer and a Shanos dancer and he comes here to share his talents with our guests and I have a photo here of June Burke providing her wool spinning experience for us. Our experience, it's really about the immersiveness, bringing the visitor into the activity. So they're not just spectators looking at the events, they can join in. Here on the screen, I have my friend, K uh, Kate Kennedy from Killery Fjord Shellfish doing an oyster shucking experience for one of our guests here at Len Keen. And then we have Brendan Keegan, one of our musicians that works with Joe Ford and Connie Cullen here, delivering the music song and dance experience. And here he's teaching the Shanos dance to a group of our Asian visitors. And also the technique of Baron playing. So we invite the guests to learn the technique of the Baron so they can join in the trad music session. And then we teach um, some Irish songs to our guests, which is always a bit of fun, but we love to promote the Irish language, the oldest vernacular language in Europe. And we're really proud to do that here. Um, and it's always huge fun. So what the guest takes home with them is an activity. They, they learn the steps to a dance and they share that with their friends at home. This is, uh, these are some interior shots of the indoor space at Glen Keen. We wanted to bring the outdoors right in inside. And um, I think that's tastefully done here. Although uh, sometimes on a really windy day, like this is the calm before the storm today, um, the scene won't be so calm. Now on the uh, bottom right of my uh, slide here, I have a photo of our craft shop. Because when we built um, and decided on building this visitor attraction, it wasn't just about the sustainability of our farm and our home. It was about embracing the community, providing a small business incubator for local craft suppliers, jewellery makers and producers, producers to have a platform to sell their unique gifts and share their unique talents. So we do that um, and we're very fortunate to have hugely talented people in the area. Community events, we have, um, and we're very proud to share our facility with local community, local active retirement groups, the local schools, opening up access to the river here, one of the cleanest rivers in Europe, the Karaniski River. And here we are working with uh, Connie O'Driscoll, where she provides uh, wonderful experiences for the local children in learning about caring and protecting our water courses. We're also part of the Mayo County Council Community Water uh, Scheme project, and that's where groups, um, again, are trained on the importance of maintaining and protecting our water courses. And then we also have a photo of Dr. Derek Midlachlan out on our peatland habitat, showing the children the unique and rare flora and fauna that exists here. Marketing started early. How do we get our, our customers? Well, um, we started our marketing activities well before construction of our facility because we 
were heavily invested and we knew it would take a considerable amount of work to win business, win bookings on the schedule and uh, start building our profile because we live in a rural location. There was an over-reliance at the time on domestic tourism and we looked to international markets for our visitor experience here. And with the support of the Mayo Local Enterprise Office and Southwest Mayo Development Company, we built our digital media platforms. We got trained up in it. It was new to me at the time. And I entered, um, attended international trade events to engage with the decision makers on when they were programming their itineraries, if they would consider the west of Ireland and indeed come north of Galway, because there's a huge concentration south of Galway for international visitors. But we're seeing that sales cycle um, with international trade is a bit longer than we anticipated. So our business has not been without its challenges, but um, it's on course, thankfully. And data harvesting is where we engage with our customers on a repeat basis. We resell the, that local unique produce through our e-commerce sites and digital media platforms. Well, 2020 was a different year for everybody. It's where we embrace that word of pivot and um, we started going virtual and going online using our social media channels to engage with our existing customers, winning new customers, keeping Glen Keane Farm and this region fresh in the minds of travellers of when it was safe to travel again. So we set up a Discover Hidden Ireland series. We uh, provided a weekly uh, content video of not just Glen Keane, but adjoining attract attractions and activities um, such as the Greenway, Killery, Shellfish and so forth. So that was a fun event, a uh, lot of work, but happy to do so. And we also provided customized videos for our tour operators because it was really important for tour operators to have content and regular up-to-date content um, again keeping the region and the island of Ireland fresh in the minds of visitors for when it was safe to travel again. Um, retail shopping experience again a huge thanks to Mayo Local Enterprise Office that supported our e-commerce site because Online uh, was really embraced in 2020, so we opened our e-shop um, where we sell our local produce and souvenirs and knitwear. Expansion into the mainland Chinese market. Well, China is a market that we have been working with since 2017. We've welcomed a lot of Chinese guests here that embrace this authentic Irish farm experience. And we responded to a request for exporting Irish products to Asia. And last week I attended the Asia Matters Global Summit. So Asia is really opened up now and it's provided a huge opportunity for businesses here. Awards, well, the awards we have won, it's really testament to the fantastic team that joined us on this journey and all of the supports we received. And we're really proud of the, the awards and that endorsement of what we do here and how we do it. Um, CIE Tours International Gold Standard Awards of Excellence, Mayo Business Awards. Um, and I was very proud to receive the Innovation on Farm Award with the Women in Business Awards in 2020 with the Irish Farmers Journal, Country Living Magazine and FBD. Supports on this slide, I've, I've listed all of the entities that have supported our business and continue to support our business. I'm hugely, hugely thankful to them because without these supports, without these entities, we would not exist. And it's so important to engage um, with these entities, reach out to them for mentoring support, financial support, training supports. There's a phenomenal amount of supports available. Um, so really thankful for those. And here I've listed our social media platforms. Please do engage with us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, we'd love to see you on our um, social media platforms. And I'm going to conclude, if I have time, 
with just a short video of a snapshot. It'll give you a flavor of the activities in a visual sense with our guests here. And the, the video was shot pre-COVID, so there is no social distancing, thankfully. But uh, I'll stop sharing my presentation now and I will reshare this video with you. Um, I'll just get it up here now. Now, can you see my screen? Yep. Good. Okay. I'm just going to play this. Um, the, the audio may be a bit loud, so I don't want to burst anyone's eardrums. So thank you. that concludes my presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and sincere thanks to everybody for inviting me to this wonderful event. Wonderful event. Gurumila Mahagav. Thank you. Gurumahagav Hain, Catherine. Um, and Catherine, if you want to maybe uh, share your screen again and maybe just put up your contact details just when we're uh, rounding off the conversation here and, and invite a couple of uh, questions, but just a few observations on it. Um, um, we had Raquel Naboa on earlier on, um, and she was talking, and obviously, great story in it, uh, one of the last slides you put up there in terms of the agencies that have supported you and helped you, uh, and the amount of, amount of networking that was going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, it sounds exhausting, we say, even at the start, you know, uh, Southwest uh, Mayo Development Company with Leader Grant, the Heritage Organizations, Leo uh, Mayo, um, and then the early work that you were doing with the tourism uh, groups and, and you know, before you even had the offering that you were doing all of all of that work. So uh, very, very important, um, all of that. Um, and Raquel put great store in that uh, aspect of being very important to reach out and connect with people and talk and ask questions. And, and obviously that's something you've experienced as well. Absolutely. Um, I can't place the amount of emphasis on the importance of that. And um, the supports are there. So it's really up to the entrepreneur to really seek out and um, the supports that are available and suitable for, for their business. And if, if you reach out to, I found with these entities, if, if the support is not, is not suitable or available, they will recommend additional supports and additional channels and avenues for you so the the support is phenomenal we are so lucky in this country um the great support of state agencies and local organizations that exist um uh, obviously uh, i i've been up there i've been up to that monument i went by, by delphi and up to that monument and had i known you were that close i would have gone on a bit further but that was before i knew you um the i'd imagine the community aspect of what you're doing is very very important um Catherine, is you're obviously steeped in community, you know, from from history, but uh, that sounds very important in terms of the offering you're providing. It is hugely important, Ulton. And to give you an example of that, um, I mentioned I attended trade shows uh, prior to the construction of the building. CIE Tours International said, OK, no problem. You, you're showing me photos here. Let me see your uh, your facilities. But um, I told them, I said, look, it's not built yet, but it will be. It'll be ready. We'll be ready. They said, OK, so we're going to send you a trial tour in 2014 based on the delivery of your experience for that tour. We will give you a contract for 2015. Well, I told the local community about this and I cannot tell you, uh, CIE sent in two buses, 98 people at the same time. 
on the 9th of September, 2014. All of the community, as far away as near Westport, came here, they delivered Irish dancing, they delivered music. Um, my neighbors spoke to the different guests at the different tables. They engaged and interacted with them. It was phenomenal because my contract, my only one tour operator that was going to deal with me in 2015 was basing all of the delivery on one day for nearly 100 people. That was a huge ask. But I, I totally understand it now. You know, tour operators really have to have the confidence the visitor attraction can deliver and will always deliver a consistent experience. And I am hugely grateful to all of the people that live around us here for what they did that day because they won the business from CIE. And then of course, we had CIE working with us and that was another accolade that I could sell to additional tour operators because if CIE were using us, well, we must be okay. Um, and that really gave credibility to the visitor attraction. So huge thanks to all of those people. Uh, and I think as well, it uh, it talks to there was a question earlier on again for Raquel. Um, you know, the 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 the, on, the entrepreneurship is one thing. The the CEO ability and sets of skills is something else. So obviously that's something you have in spades as well. Being able to pull all of those des disparate elements together. Uh, to achieve a, a coherent offering and especially to be able to, uh, as you say, pivot uh, over the last nearly two years now and, and keep an offering out there and keep it front of mind and in people's eye line so that, please God, when things do settle down a bit more, that um, they can get back there again. Yes, absolutely. And I like huge thanks to Zoom. Um, I attended the Global um, Summit last week with Asia Matters. The CEO of Zoom was was on it. You know, I, I pinged him. I'm like, thank you so much, because what Zoom allowed me to do was to go out into the middle of a field with the sheepdogs, you know, with my audio, with my wonderful husband, Jim, with the camera, with the wind blowing to create customized tour operator virtual uh, sheep herding displays because that's all we could do we couldn't physically provide it here um so embracing that online world and and all of the channels that were made available to do business online you know and we don't have to travel as much anymore look at us here today it's absolutely fantastic you know the world is constantly evolving and changing and we're happy to adapt to that that's fantastic. Um, I'm just going to throw it, if there's any quick question from anybody for either Catherine or Alison on the W Power Project, you can stick it in the chat or if you want to come on and ask now, um, uh, but we, we won't uh, delay overlay. Um, so how are things looking, Catherine would say, obviously we're, we're back in a sort of a, an imagine this time of the year is a bit quiet with you as well, but are you confident for the year ahead? Are you, are you hopeful or are you confident for the year ahead? Very confident uh, for the year ahead. We have a lot of bookings on our schedule for going into 2023 actually. Um, and I'm delighted to say, you know, this September, we won a new tour operator. Never expected that to happen. Uh, Globus started working with us. And the first day we had two buses in. Um, huge uh, gratitude to the team here as well, because uh, it's challenging times dealing with international visitors. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the outlook is very positive. We're planning to launch our first product into Asia for our e-commerce digital uh, platform in uh, February 2022. So that's on online. And um, yeah, so you have to keep positive. Always look on the bright side. Absolutely. Um, listen, I, I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Um, and Catherine, um, we, we've recorded the session. There's quite a few people who couldn't make it today. And, and thankfully, the weather managed to say OK for us. So we're going to be circulating this. And uh, as we've done with Raquel, I know some people are looking to connect with her. So um, if they want to connect directly with you, that'd be fantastic or, or through ourselves. So Catherine, thanks very much for your time and for your story. And I will be up to see you soon and, and get a look around uh, and uh, 
and uh, and participate in that. And we'd like to thank uh, Raquel from earlier on this morning as well. Uh, and I'd like to thank Alison uh, and Helene uh, in terms of their presentation on the W Power project. Uh, and also my colleagues, Neve and Chantal, who supported uh, me in getting this event organized today. So uh, uh, sincere thanks to everybody um, for participating uh, and for their contributions and uh, stay safe. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.